Hey guys, how are you all doing today? I am on vacation right now, and I'm going to be gone for a very long time. The university I'm attending for some reason gives us insane breaks, so I'm going to be gone for around a month, which means the next few videos, including this one, has been pre-recorded. In addition to that, I'll be sure to try to feature some guests so you guys don't miss out on the action. Today's video is going to be on Tony Heller. To be honest, I don't know too much about him or his videos, just that he makes content doubting anthropogenic climate change. I did see a few of his videos when he had that back and forth with Potholer, but I won't be responding to those since, you know, I'm not just gonna button on that. In fact, I never planned on responding to Tony at all, but I kept seeing his name in my comments section, so here we are. I picked out a random video, one that had a title that caught my eye, so let's get right to it. I know I talked about climate change quite often recently, don't get used to it, YouTube still doesn't favor this topic on my channel. Hello, this is Tony Heller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. In this video, I'm going to reveal the cure for global warming alarmism. I'll tell you what the real cure is. All you have to do is publish a paper that goes against all the scientific research we have on anthropogenic climate change, have it peer-reviewed, and then publish in a respectable journal, discredit all other science we have on this topic, then win your Nobel Prize. It's simple, right? The press is full of hysterical stories today about carbon dioxide levels being the highest in human history. They say that carbon dioxide levels in 2018 reached 408 parts per million. Well, that sounds bad. We must have really messed up the planet. Yeah, remember like a decade ago everyone was talking about CO2 reaching 400 parts per million and that was like, oh fuck, let's not go there. Yeah, those were the good times. It's actually kind of crazy how our emissions of CO2 has increased over the last few years despite us knowing about this problem for so long. It's true that people tend to think more about the present than the future. As long as deniers like Tony Heller exists, I suppose we're not going to be slowing down anytime soon. Kind of scary to think about, yet there's not much we can do as individuals. But before we go and put on our gas mask like the Times of India shows, Let's try doing some thinking instead. I mean, it's not like you'll die of CO2 poisoning from this. The purpose of human lungs is to convert carbohydrates in our blood and oxygen in the air into energy which our body can use. The fuck kind of biology classes did you attend? That's not what the lungs do. They don't convert carbohydrates and oxygen into energy. Like, what is this? You're inhaling bread now? Is that how the lungs work? No, they supply oxygen to the blood and they eliminate CO2 as waste. The production of energy happens in the cellular level, in individual cells. I mean, this is mostly a nitpick since it doesn't change your point later, so let's see what else you have to say. Carbohydrates are basically made up of carbon and water. New, they're mostly made of carbon and hydrogen with some oxygen. Saying that carbohydrates is made of water is a misrepresentation of what they actually are. Chemical reactions do involve water, but to say that water is inside of it is not accurate whatsoever. Closest you get are hydroxyl groups. Human lungs burn carbohydrates in our bloodstream and release carbon dioxide and water vapor into the air. You know, I tried to give you the benefit of the doubt. I thought you were trying to say it supplies the oxygen for energy production with carbohydrates and just misspoke somehow despite, I'm guessing, you're reading off a script. But it turns out you actually believe the lungs perform the function of burning carbohydrates with oxygen to produce energy for the body since you've said it twice now. Sure, the individual lung tissues require energy for itself, but the purpose of the lungs is to circulate oxygen into the blood. The cells of the body then take this oxygen along with glucose in the blood to produce energy through aerobic respiration. By the way, it's glucose, not carbohydrates, because carbohydrates are broken down to monosugars in the digestive system. Geez, I'm not a huge fan of always having to explain such low-level topics. I'm here doing a master's degree and I'm still stuck explaining high school level biology. Anyway, the cells in our body produce carbon dioxide as waste and that gets circulated in the blood. Most of it is dissolved and this serves as a good buffer system as well. What do you know? Your body is quite clever in making use of everything it has, even waste products. The lungs then release carbon dioxide into the air at the same time as it collects oxygen. Everything here is passive movement due to the concentration differences of oxygen and carbon dioxide throughout the respiratory system. Why did I bring up concentration? Because that's something important we shall be discussing next. If it's cold outside, you can often see the water vapor from your breath condensing. But the carbon dioxide is invisible, at least for most people. A few unusually gifted people like Greta Thunberg believe that they can see carbon dioxide. Well, technically you can if it's solidified into dry ice. I'm sorry, I'm going to stop the nitpicking now. This must be very distracting because when your lungs exhale, you release 40,000 parts per million CO2 into the atmosphere. That's 100 times higher than the CO2 level which the press is hysterical about today. As ridiculous as it sounds, our bodies do exhale about just under 100 times the concentration of CO2 that the atmosphere has. Saying 40,000 parts per million, however, is kind of dishonest because most people don't understand the context of this unit. PPM is useful in measuring the concentration of CO2 in the atmosphere because it is very sensitive in its scale. For kind of the same reason we use micrometers and nanometers when looking at bacteria and viruses. Measuring in, say, partial pressure is less useful because we can only work with 760 as the maximum for millimeters of mercury instead of a million. Inhaled air, for example, has approximately 0 
0.3 millimeters of mercury and partial pressure. But if we increased this concentration in the atmosphere, it'd be difficult to grasp because the increase would be something like 0.001 or something. You would have a hard time presenting, discussing, or drawing conclusions. This is the same for, say, percentage. So instead, we use parts per million. But because we use such a sensitive scale, something like 40,000 sounds incredibly high. And by pointing that out, Tony seems to be implying that 400 ppm is nothing in comparison. But not only is that misleading for people who don't fully understand the units we use, it also fails to put these two numbers into context. Yes, the amount of CO2 we release just from exhaling is quite high in concentration, but that contributes nothing and is minuscule compared to the CO2 that is being emitted into the atmosphere and the concentration of CO2 in general. Meanwhile, because of the huge size of the Earth and its atmosphere, an increase to 400 ppm is a lot, and that's something you won't understand if you think about 40,000 ppm without context. I'm going to use pounds here because all online sources are in pounds. An average human breathes out about 2.3 pounds of CO2 per day. Multiply that by 7.5 billion people and 365 days per year, divide that by the 43 billion tons of CO2 projected to be emitted by humans in 2019, and that's only about 6 to 7 percent. So as scary as 40,000 ppm sounds, it's nothing because we don't breathe a lot, especially compared to the CO2 being emitted from fossil fuels, and compared to the overall amount of CO2 in the atmosphere. A high concentration means nothing if only a small volume is released, and when we think about CO2 emissions, we need to think about the absolute values, because it makes more sense in the context. Omitting all of these in your explanation, Tony, is incredibly dishonest, not to mention how the CO2 from our breath is different than that released by fossil fuels anyway, but I won't get to that today. Let's put the 408 parts per million CO2 in perspective. 408 parts per million is about the same as 4 parts per 10,000. This is a picture of Madison Square Garden in New York which holds 20,000 people. If each of these 20,000 people represented one gas molecule in the atmosphere, then only 8 people in this crowd would represent carbon dioxide molecules. Almost all of the other people in the audience would represent nitrogen, oxygen, or water vapor molecules. First of all, ppm uses mass, not quantity, so your analogy is already wrong. Second of all, 400 ppm isn't a lot if you think about it in absolute terms instead of the context. Yes, that's only 400 out of 1 million, but in the context of our atmosphere, it's quite a lot. It's enough to break temperature records and drastically change our climate and our ecosystems. Basically, you're using an analogy that grossly misrepresents the situation. Greta likes to ride on fossil fuel powered trains. People have done studies on trains and found that CO2 levels get close to 3,000 parts per million, or more than eight times the normal atmospheric level. Okay, so I'm going to skip to the part of the video where he makes a new point instead of just repeating the same thing over and over again. Yes, CO2 concentrations can increase to higher amounts compared to the atmosphere, but that means nothing if you don't consider the context. If you put a very high concentrated food coloring, but only one drop of it into a tank of water, it won't change the color of the water to be seen by the naked eye because of the volume of the food coloring. But if you add enough individual drops, you will see a small change. And in the context of our atmosphere, a small change like this is enough to make huge differences in climate and ecosystems. Also if you think that people are saying this 400 ppm will affect our breathing, it won't, and nobody's ever claimed that. Now let's get to the solution to climate alarmism. Commercial greenhouse operators pump the CO2 levels inside their greenhouses way up in order to make the plants grow faster and use less water. Life needs and loves carbon dioxide. This argument is probably one of the most ignorant arguments I've ever heard coming from deniers. Plants don't work the way you think they do. Anyone with any basic understanding of plant science knows this. I made an entire video before explaining this, so allow me to just find a clip or something so I don't have to re-record all that. Just knowing that CO2 is an ingredient for photosynthesis does not mean more CO2 will increase the rate of plant growth. I talked about this in my previous videos, so I don't want to go into too much detail now. But basically, gases are exchanged through pores in the leaves of plants called stomata. But CO2 and oxygen aren't the only things that pass through these pores. Water does too, and plants lose a lot of water through transpiration, in which water leaves the stomata in the form of water vapor. This causes a negative pressure within the xylem of plants that can pull up more water from the soil, along with capillary action. Plants can control when to open up these pores, and when they open, you bet that everything is being exchanged. So while the plants are obtaining more CO2, they are also losing more water. It's a trade-off, and this has to be managed properly. Now, as carbon dioxide increases in the atmosphere, that makes it so more CO2 is diffused into the stomata per unit of time. That sounds good, right? No, because CO2 comes with the side effect of increasing temperatures, and as temperature increases, the rate of transpiration also increases, and this rate of water loss goes up faster than the rate of CO2 absorption for the vast majority of plants. As a result, they keep their stomata closed for longer periods of time. That means less CO2 absorption, and less photosynthesis, and less plant mass. And water isn't even the only limiting factor here. Nitrogen is also limited, so without an increase in water and nitrogen supply, increasing CO2 in temperatures will not help plant growth. And by extension to this argument, it's really annoying when people say, well, 
while greenhouses increase CO2 for more plant growth. See, the thing is, greenhouses are heavily controlled. The environment is exactly what we want it to be. That means the plants get a proper supply of both water and nitrogen to keep up with the higher levels of CO2. Realistically, this can't be done for every single plant or every single crop we have on Earth, which is why you can't use greenhouses to say that carbon dioxide is good for plants. Thank you, past me, for that excellent explanation. I couldn't have said it better myself. Plant growth ceases when the level of CO2 gets below 200 parts per million. So if climate alarmists are successful in creating the zero carbon world they say they want, their weed is going to stop growing. Once they find that out, that'll put a quick end to climate alarmism. No one, not a single soul, is trying to decrease carbon dioxide levels to zero. At this point, I honestly can't tell if this video is a joke or not. Like, did he make this video on April Fool's Day and accidentally release it too late or something? I haven't watched enough of his videos to know. Anyway, that's my time today. I made this in a rush because I have to make quite a few videos before I leave for the holiday, so forgive me if I misspoke somewhere. Thank you to Fireshard for your loyal support over at Patreon, and I'll see you all next week.